call this meeting to order. Thank you all for joining. Uh, appreciate that. Russell or Deborah, if you could please call the roll. Certainly, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Breakfast? Here. Vice Mayor Hartman? Here. Councilmember Albritton? Here. Councilmember Jablonski? Here. Councilmember Kaczynski? Here. We have a quorum, Mayor. Excellent. Thank you. If you'll please join me in the pledge. Mayor, I believe we're getting uh, feedback due to some cell phones that might be up on the dais. So if we can remove the cell phones from the dais. Thank you. Okay. Um, once again, welcome to our uh, town council meeting. Um, our first order of business is a proclamation for Arbor Day. Please. So whereas in 1872, Sterling Morton proposed on the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this holiday called Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas in accordance with the policies and goals of the Town of Southwest Ranchers Comprehensive Plan adopted May 8th, 2003, the town set forth measurable objectives for the protection and enhancement of critical ecological systems integral to South Florida's and the town's natural environment, including the maintenance and improvement of air quality by increasing tree coverage in the town and by meeting the standards to become recognized by the National Arbor Day Foundation as a Tree City USA. And whereas on December 20th, 2007, Southwest Ranchers was recognized as a Tree City USA, and whereas continuing to meet the standards for designation as a Tree City USA provides direction for management of the town's tree resources, encourages public education about tree care, and promotes a sense of pride in the community. And whereas Southwest Ranches has continued to meet all standards and requirements for continuing designation as Tree City USA, and will be recognized in 2021 for its 15th consecutive year. And whereas annual proclamation of Arbor Day in Southwest Ranches is a requirement for ongoing continuing recognition as Tree City USA. And whereas trees reduced the erosion of topsoil, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce life giving oxygen and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees in our town increase property values enhance the economic vitality of business areas and beautify our community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Ranches that annually the third Friday in January shall be recognized as Arbor Day in the Town of Southwest Ranches. Further, the Council urges all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day, to support efforts to protect our tree resources, and to plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Dated this 14th day of October, 2021, Mayor Steve Breikers. Thank you. You know, Arbor Day is um, something that is, I think, pretty special to our town because of the nature and, uh, and character of our town. Um, I want to thank December. I know uh, you do a lot to um, maintain the trees and the look and the feel of our town. And so appreciate that and all, that, all those that help you. I know you have a ton of volunteers also. So thank you all. All right, um, the next item on the agenda, I am really excited to uh, kick off this item. We have, as I think most everybody in town knows, we have a uh, relatively um, new visitor coming to town that uh, is creating a lot of issues for a lot of the li uh, wildlife, livestock, um, things like that in town. So um, December and Chris Brownlow, um, were uh, got to know uh, Kristen and um, and kind of set this up so I know we've got residents here that are specifically want to understand and hear also what's going on but this is critical to our town um, we are really looking forward to being educated and to understand better what what we can and cannot do so thank you with that I don't know if there's any any other additional comments before bring up Kristen I think we're good Totally up to you. 
totally up to you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Then I won't get stuff all over this. So coyotes and you. Coyotes have been around in the United States for a very long time. Is there a pointer so uh, I can change the slides or do I just I say think we do change? Have them. Okay, so you can go ahead and change it. Oh, sorry. My name is Kristen Haas. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist and a uh, executive director of Youth Environmental Alliance. And I also lead the Florida Master Naturalist Program here in Broward County, which is to teach adults. Um, uh, my wildlife biology has led me to work with the Arizona Game and Fish. And there's lots of coyotes in Arizona. Uh, it's the desert. That's kind of where they started out. And um, I also work with Wildlife Services, which is with the USDA. And that has to do with the interface of wildlife with human beings and how to mitigate that. And um, Hey, Kristen, can yeah. I ask just one thing? That, that podium actually there is on wheels. Maybe we can just turn a little bit so you can, yeah, actually the other way, so you can look towards the, the, audience. <laughs> you want me to the look audience over there. Well, I also have to look there, so yeah, I thought Let me see. we can look let's over that. Go that there. Yeah, let's do that. Is that good? I think so. Whatever, whatever probably you prefer. probably a really good idea. I'm just used to standing in front of a classroom and like screaming my head off at the children. <laughs> Not really screaming, projecting, sorry. So anyways, <laughs> so I never use a mic. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. So we do environmental education and environmental restoration. And that's how I met December. She was actually one of my students for the Master Naturalist program. Okay, so uh, what we're going to look at, we're going to look a little bit at history and distribution of coyotes throughout the United States, their family life, behavior, because you need it. If you're going to deal with the challenges of wildlife, you need to understand the behavior of wildlife, okay? Uh, reproductive rate benefits of having them around, there are some. Challenges of having them around, which a lot of people are having to deal with now, and basically how to live with them. How are you going to deal with these things in your, in your environment now, all right? And then there's some resources at the end. Go ahead, you can, who's pushing the button? Is that you? Okay, thank you. So, um, <coughs> We are all sharing this planet together. That's just the way it is. Uh, the wildlife was here way before humans were, and uh, we're, we're co-evolving now. We only have one Earth, so we have got to learn how to share it with wildlife. Wildlife is really important to us, whether it be a predator or a prey species or whatever, because it's part of the biodiversity on the planet. If you do not have biodiversity, we eventually suffer. We suffer through our health, we suffer through uh, the ecology around us, uh, bio biodiversity actually promotes health because it keeps nutrients in the system and we happen to be the top of the food web, so we rely on everything that's below us on the food web, all right? Okay, go ahead. <coughs> so uh, history and distribution. So coyotes, if you look on the map here, um, they're here to stay because we've created a perfect scenario for them. They, um, they've been around for over, over 12,000 years, okay? And actually, that's pretty much when we arrived in Florida is 12,000 years ago. So we've kind of been together, um, at least in the United States, about the same time. In the 1800s, they were pretty much stuck in the area that's red. So the uh, Western United States and like central, central and Western United States. But then around 1900, they started to move because we started to move. We started to move, we started to develop, we started to drain wetlands, we started to create roads. That's why I have the coyote running down the road there. We created pathways for them. Our 18 miles of levees, canals and levees here in um, Florida provide roadways for them to move. They don't have to run along the roads, they got canals and levees to go. So, and then um, they, they prefer like, kind of unforested areas, not deep forest areas. And look at what we've done. We've created that. So it's a perfect place for them to live. Um, and now they are actually all over the United States, South America, etc. So they're not just expanding here. They're expanding north and they're expanding south. And it's causing all kinds of issues, ecologically speaking. We've broken up forest. That's what fragmentation means. It means we break it up into little pieces so it's easier for them to move around. Um, and we've also gotten rid of their predators, wolves. They're terrified of wolves. I actually used to own wolf hybrids. <coughs> and the second the coyotes saw me drive up, 
and my wolf hybrids jump out of the truck, they took off. And they were already far away, but I mean, they really took off. But we got rid of the wolves, so now they've got no predators. Um, no natural predators, anyways. Not, not a lot. And um, they also hybridize with dogs, which makes it a little bit easier for them to, to move around in our world, in our developed world. Go ahead. So they do live in packs. Their group size is really not that big. It's only about six adults in addition to the pups. Those packs are stable units. They've got an alpha, and, uh, alpha male and female. Those are usually the breeders of the pack. And then they've got some omegas and betas, which were previous pups. And then they have their pups. They don't make their packs huge and huge and huge. They want it stable and balanced so they can just live in their area with, with the resources that they have. Resources being food, space, that kind of thing, all right? Um, and typically, only the alpha male and female breed, typically. Coyotes also defend their territory. So just like dogs, they wander around, they pee on things. That's to show where their territory is. And then um, they'll defend that space from intruders. Now, an intruder to them usually looks like another dog or a larger animal. We are intruders, but typically they will shy away from humans. They will see a person and off they'll go, all right? Unless they've been fed or they've been habituated in some way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, um, <clears throat> and instead of attacking like a larger dog, because coyotes are only about 12, 25 pounds, they're pretty small. They're tall and they're fluffy, but they're pretty small. But as opposed to attacking something much larger than them, they may lead it away out of their territory. So sometimes if a coyote comes up and it sees your pet dog or something, but it's big, it may be just leading it away. Um, and the males may roam over territories as large as 36 square miles, but the females stay in much smaller areas like six square miles. Because the males are looking for other females sometimes. And then they're also trying to find food and checking out uh, new territories, that kind of thing. Okay, you can go ahead. So, like I said, they naturally shy away. You rarely see them, but in these urban settings, and this is kind of urban, they get used to people. There's food out, there's pet food out. They're like, hey, there's food around people. This is great. Um, and they see us all the time, and we're not causing a problem for them, so then they'll come closer sometimes. Um, they'll typically watch us from a distance. They're very curious. And they like to figure stuff out. They're very wily. That's why the wily coyote, they really truly are. But they like to watch us from a distance, see what's going on. Um, but that's usually the case. If that's not the case, it's because they've been habituated. Somebody is feeding them. And people love to feed wild. Oh, look at the cute little coyote. I want to be its friend. We have a saying, fed wildlife is dead wildlife. Because it either becomes habituated and eats the wrong food and gets sick, or it becomes habituated starts causing a problem for us, and that ain't gonna happen. So there goes the wildlife, all right? And you'll see this with squirrels, you'll see this with birds, etc. It just happens to be that coyotes are a little bit uh, more scary than a squirrel that's, that um, is coming up to you asking for food, okay? Um, so habituation causes them to be comfortable. You don't want that. Instead, you want to haze them, and we'll talk a little bit about hazing in a minute. And just so you understand the statistics, coyotes' attacks on people are extremely rare, and there are more people killed by champagne corks being blown up at them than coyotes biting people, okay? I've lived around coyotes my entire life, lots of coyotes. We're talking 25 coyotes going through my yard, howling up a storm, and never once have I been bitten by a coyote. Go ahead. So um, they're urban, they're suburban, they live in rural areas, they're everywhere, okay? The only time they're a problem is when they're habituated for the most part, um, or they see your little fluffy dog on the end of a leash, and we'll talk about that in a minute. They are top predators in the e ecosystem. It's very important to keep other things in check, like rodents. Um, Nobody wants rats at their house. Coyotes help keep that in check. So they'll eat things like squirrels and rabbits and other rodents, snakes, that kind of thing, as well as berries and whatnot. They're kind of omnivorous. So they are important for that. We got rid of the top carnivores. We got rid of the, the panthers. We don't have wolves. So 
somebody has to take up that time or, or take up that space, all right? Go ahead. So here's the challenge. You're like, well, I want to just go out there and shoot them all. Great, fine. The problem is, you guys ever hear the story about the, um, the fishermen that were really upset because the starfish were eating their, I think their mussels or something like that. They were in direct competition with the starfish. Did anybody ever hear that story? So the fishermen caught up all the starfish, chopped them up into little bitsy pieces and threw them back in the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> the fisheries crashed because the starfish, all those little pieces turned into brand new starfish. Coyotes are kind of the same, not that you can cut them up and you'll have lots of little coyotes running around, but um, when you start to kill off members of their population, they actually go into survival mode and they will start reproducing earlier. They will have larger litters and they may have more litters than normally. So if you start killing them off, you're going to get more, not less. And new coyotes are going to come move into their space. So that's really not an option. They've tried it. There was even a study done where they eradicated 75% of a population every year, 75% every year for 50 years, and the population never declined. It just kept hanging in there. They're not going to go away, okay? So we have to be more tolerant. We have to think more like a predator and learn to live with them. And it's doable. They do it all over the West and the, and the central part of the United States. We've been doing it for years. Go ahead. So distance is your friend, okay? Coyotes, just like dogs, they're curious, they play, and sometimes their play is interpreted or their cur curiosity is misinterpreted as aggression, okay? I put the term puff up, they hate that. If wildlife is coming at you, look big, yell and scream, flail, always look them in the eye, don't turn your back and run, that's a bad idea because that's fun to play with, and then you look like prey, all right? So you want to haze them. So s keep your distance if you can. Keep your pets indoors. If you want to lose your cat, let it outside where there's coyotes. You will lose your cat eventually, I promise you. Keep your cats indoors, especially um, in the evenings, the evenings and the mornings. If, you, if for some reason you're going to let them out, let them out during the day. Train them to come back in by night, okay? Um, and your, your small dogs especially, keep them on a leash and keep them on a solid leash, not the kind that scopes out because you don't have as much control over that. And then they get further away from you and then it's much easier to prey on them if you're a coyote than if they're closer to you. They don't want to deal with people. They really don't want to deal with us unless they've been fed. They do not want to deal with us. So the closer you can keep your pet to you, the safer it's going to be. Um, Again, walk away with eyes on the prize. Never turn your back on a predator. Actually, I think there's one that you're not supposed to stare at. That might be a mountain lion. But still, puff up, look big, look scary, all right? And they do bite the hand that feeds. If they are being fed, they will eventually end up getting too close to people, all right? So do not feed them, which means that keep your pet food indoors. Don't be putting food around your yard, even bird feeders can start to attract them because they know that there's birds going to be there and then they're going to go to the bird feeder to eat the birds. All right? So keep that in mind. You may want to just put the bird feeders out midday or something like that. Or I just like to plant my yard so it's got enough berries and seeds growing in it that the birds can feed naturally. That way I'm not attracting predators. Um, okay, go ahead. <coughs> so protecting your small dog. Avoid using the flexi leash, like I said. Um, if there are bushy areas or edgy uh, zones where you have um, bushes or, or thick grass or trees, don't walk your dog next to that. Don't let them walk around there because the coyote can just pop out, take it, and off it goes. All right? Give yourself some distance between that kind of thing when you're walking as much as you can. Um, stand or walk with other people and or larger dogs. Walk in a group. That helps. Avoid walking small dogs at dawn or dusk. That's when the predators are out. They like that, all right? If a coyote gets too close for comfort, maintain eye contact, pull your dog closer to you, or if it's a small dog, carry it and haze the coyote. Yell and scream and flail, lunge at it, that kind of stuff to make it go away. Hopefully you guys won't get into that situation. This is like worst case scenario, but it really does work. Um, 
if the coyote does not leave, it may be protecting a territory or a den of pups. So you just want to, if, if you see a coyote, get your little dog and go the other way. All right, there you go. And then change your routine. Now, um, you may have poultry or livestock, or even if you have small dogs or whatever, ways to keep things out of your yard or away from your other animals is you can actually put in an electric fence around the perimeter. When you do, you want to put wires that are low so the coyote can't dig under your fence and it zaps the nose or the feet or whatever. And then put a wire at nose level. They're about this high. So put a wire where a coyote's nose would be so when it walks up to the fence, it hits that wire. They remember pain, trust me when I say. And it really does help keep them out. And then you may want to put one at the top because they can climb if they really want to or jump and then they would, they would hit that wire and then they would go the other way. All right. Also, the Anatolian Shepherd is something that we use a lot in Arizona to protect our livestock and um, sheep, pigs, cows, chickens. An Anatolian Shepherd, when you raise it with whatever it is you're trying to protect, that's their family, they protect it. And coyotes do not like these dogs at all. They will run the other way. Um, also, you could, for smaller areas or enclosures, if you use chain link fence, coyotes can't bite through it. Most stuff can't get through it. But put a bottom on it, a bottom that goes out, because what happens is animals will hit the fence and then they'll dig to go under it. So they'll hit the fence, they'll dig, and then they're going to run into more chain link. You want at least two or three feet of chain link out this way. And I would put two or three feet on the other side to keep your pets from trying to dig out. Okay? Um, and then you can either put a complete top if it's a small enclosure on it. Or you can put, uh, like you've seen at zoos, you know how, they, how it goes up and then they angle it. Or even prisons, <laughs> they angle it out put more chain link there so if something does try to climb out it can't climb up and around or climb up it can't climb up and around okay and then if you're really serious and you've got like crazy coyotes which I don't imagine this happening at all they don't want to work that hard for their food that's why they're like snagging small dogs as they go around um, you could put double walls and have a path in between that way they can't get all the way into wherever your poultry is or your livestock does anybody have any questions on that? This does work. Um, I worked trying to keep, uh, it, well, keeping wildlife in pens, because I worked at wildlife rehabilitation centers. Um, also, we kept wildlife in pens and other, and predators out of pens, because I used to work on the black-footed ferret project, and things love to eat ferrets. They're really cute and fluffy and yummy. So um, we used all these techniques and didn't have a problem. I've used these techniques to keep raccoons out of my garage because they like to get in and try to eat my cat food. It works. Okay, next slide. So um, there are a lot of resources on how to haze coyotes, how to deal with coyotes, and you may even want to create an, uh, a plan, a master plan in your community about how you're going to deal with the coyote issue. Like I said, they're not going anywhere. I promise you they're not going to go anywhere. A lot of these invasive animal species, they follow us because we're kind of invasive. Wherever we go, we change the habitat, and the animals that like the habitat we like follow us around. Okay? So they're here. Killing them is not an option. Education is an option. Maybe helping people build fences or, or exclusion areas if, if they're getting hit by coyotes a lot. Um, but really it's about keeping the food away from them so they don't want to come into your yard and eat and that kind of thing. If you make it difficult, they're not going to go in there. So, and there's a ton of stuff on the internet. And if you're going to look at it, look at places that have had coyotes forever, like Arizona, like the Midwest, like see how ranchers are dealing with it from the Midwest, because coyotes have always been there. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, I've got a, a question. Yeah. So I know a lot of neighbors here are using um, donkeys. Yeah. Do you, do you have any experience with that? Uh, I know that donkeys are really good because they are extremely protective of their little group in there. Right, and right. they're, they, <laughs> they pack a wallop. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, okay. so that's not a bad so idea. That's an option. Okay. Yeah, uh, and you could walk your donkey with your dog, I suppose, while you're going down the street. But yeah, maybe yeah. I could make a couple of quick comments on donkeys. Sure. So the property down the road here that had a whole bunch of sheep on it, mm -hmm. there were two donkeys there. There was, at the end, one sheep and two donkeys. Donkey didn't do much good. The coyotes yeah, I, well, got I've, everything? I've heard, yeah, I've heard some cases like that where it did not work. I've heard some cases where it does. Yeah. So. I have a friend up in uh, Royal Palm Beach, mm -hmm. and she's had donkeys for years, and until she got a Great Pyrenees, she couldn't right. get rid of it. I mean, they, the, uh, the coyotes are eating her chicks. That's how bad it was. Great Pyrenees, nothing bothers them. Anymore. Exactly, yeah, because remember, wolves are... Don't trust them, that's all. They're natural predators, so they have built into their genetics that big dog is bad, right? <coughs> and the Great Pyrenees and the Anatolian Shepherds were raised to protect those that they were raised with, you know, farm animals basically. So they do a very good job. Great. I have, I have a question. Sure. If, if you're not, um, um, very informative. Thank you, Ms. Haas. I oh, you're welcome. really appreciate it. Um, uh, this is a very general question uh, dealing with wildlife bi biology. As you know, we're like the python capital of, the, of America <laughs> yeah. right now. Um, and the University of Florida has a program where they're, yeah, and I believe it's called, uh, where they put out a Judas snake, uh -huh. female. Is anything like, uh, you know, with a tracker on it, is anything like that <clears throat> being done with the coyotes? I have not heard of that. And one of the reasons is because they're pack animals and yeah. they just have their pack. Coyotes are not that difficult to track down. Um, yeah, because the because they're only going to breed in certain areas. I mean, you kind of need a Judas for for pythons because they're so cryptic and they're really hard to find, and they can be in the wetlands or be in the uplands or whatever. Mm. Coyotes are really only going to be in the uplands, which we've created more, right? They weren't down here when it was all Everglades, um, so they're only going to be kind of in the higher and drier areas. Not to say they can't swim; they can definitely swim, and they will swim to tree islands and stuff like that. But they're pretty easy to find especially if they start getting more comfortable because you can hear them howl so you can stake out their territory you know yeah but i haven't heard of anything like okay. that okay it was a curiosity question. yeah anything Great. else i have a question are you aware of what the south dakota have done to the coyote bear no so they hide the south dakota right Right. Yeah, I they're going to kill them. This, this town should hire some bounty hunters and get rid of this. It's very nice. I am a lover of animals. I love in my property, I have all kinds of animals, from raccoons to, to, to squirrels, uh, to uh, some, some snakes <laughs> also. Uh, but it is really a stretch to make believe that all the owners of houses and little farms in this country, and this city, I'm sorry, are going to be sacrificing themselves and their lives and the uh, uh, way of having fun with their dogs outside the house at all kinds of hours because coyotes cannot be touched, cannot be, uh, can be ignored. As we, uh, we need them here. I have property in this, con in this city since 1978. Mm -hmm. I have never seen what they have done in the last six months. Right. They went into my farm, they killed sheep in my farm, I had to buy three donkeys, okay? They tried to kill a, a baby cow just born, mm -hmm. and they thank will. God for the bull that didn't allow that to happen. Right. But I think it's a disaster what's happening in this city where people, not me, but some people are paying millions of dollars for houses, and you have to be aware that, uh, yeah, and by the way, if they have rabies, it's gonna be something else. I right. saw on television, Channel 10, I think it was, about three months ago, a guy during the day walking his dog with a leash and a coyote came here and really killed the 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 the, the, uh, the dog the guy couldn't do anything about it and it was t terrifying to see what was happening at that time 
Right. So, I, you know, it's nice to be living with coyotes, but I don't know that the coyotes well, like to live with us. As far as South Dakota, I'd like to know how long the coyotes we're not repopulating that area because if you do massive kills like that, you may get a, a year or two break in the coyotes because it takes a while for them to get back to the area. But unless you're going to hire somebody to do it constantly, they're going to have you're going to have the reproductive issue and new coyotes are going to come in. So then you're just constantly paying money to get rid of them. Um, I know you say it's a stretch for people to make this change, but like I said, I've been living with coyotes my whole life. And the only issue I ever had was when I let my cat out and the cat eventually disappeared. Um, if you, you don't need to be terrified. You just need to be more aware of where you're walking and if there's coyotes in the area. And you want to spread the word that they don't get fed because when they get fed, they get more used to people and hazing them and all that other stuff. It's really more of an awareness and, a, and more training. You know, we're not used to pa having to pay attention to that because we don't haven't really had predators down here until recently, right? So, the, but the point is this: though. they're in a rampage. They have killed sheep. They have killed other animals. They have killed chickens. Uh, they're in a rampage. It's every I every day we know s somebody lost some either pets or or, or but poultry. But that's because we are not doing what it, we need to be doing to make sure they're staying off of our property because we are, this is a relatively new issue. I mean, I've only been hearing about coyotes down here for I haven't heard 12 them. years, something like that. I haven't heard, the, I mean, I've been here. I have a farm also. Right. I haven't heard of coyotes here until six or seven months ago. Oh, yeah, no, they, they were here. They just haven't made it down, and they found your farm. And they're like, this is great. Well, I, don't know what they they, I don't know what they were eating. You know? but, oh, uh, they, were, they, right. they started moving down, so they just keep moving down. And they do eat cats, like I said. So the feral cat colonies are a food source for coyotes. It's a great attractant for them. Um, he had a question. Can I get his question first? Okay, yeah. Hi, thank you for Hi. coming. You're welcome. Um, so there's a lot of talk going back and forth on Facebook and things like that. Can we shoot them? I'm not personally saying that. Can we shoot them? Can we trap them? Are you allowed to shoot a, a handgun or a rifle? Maybe law enforcement can not clear this up. Not within a quarter mile of a house, I don't think, right? Uh, I wouldn't recommend the liability of it. E even if you have a two-acre piece of property, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. A 22 um, will pass that really, really easily. And it could go through them. They're pretty small. But um, yeah. trapping, you're probably, you probably have to get a permit for trapping. You'd have to talk to FWC about that. You could get a permit for trapping them and relocating them or maybe humanely euthanizing it. But again, you're going to get more in there. So if you're going to do that, you're going to want to make sure that you also protect your property if you don't want them to come in and, and get your livestock. For the issue you're having, I would get an Anatolian Shepherd or what was the other one that was suggested? Get a dog, a Great Pyrenees. You're already feeding a bunch of animals. Get one that's going to protect the whole thing. And then you're not going to run into that rampage, you know? Do they sense, um, we're on a couple acres. We're in Rolling Oaks. We have mm -hmm. a couple good-sized dogs. Do they sense, and they sleep outside, do they sense if they were coming up to the fence that you have dogs and they're going to shy away? Yeah. Probably. Especially if they're good size. And the other yes. thing you can do, um, you can actually buy coyote urine online and you can go spread it around your property to help keep them at bay. But your dogs are already doing that. They're already marking their territory. So that is most likely going to keep the coyotes at bay unless you have smaller things that come in or you're putting your food outside. Okay. Right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank but you. Definitely. I mean, I never had coyote issues and I had big dogs all the time. It's the smaller ones that are the problem, you know. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Terry McGoldrick Fernandez. I've, this is my husband, Mike. Uh, we have a farm. A lot of your suggestions of with the fencing and uh, uh, and the trappings, we've already done that. We've spent two hundred dollars on a trap and the my neighbors I'm speaking only for my home and right. for my neighbor's home uh, she has a camera they're out every day anytime they want running around you've tried electric fence 
no ma'am we have quite a bit of property and that's yeah. quite a bit of an investment that we actually we're sacrificing our money uh i can't really afford to put electric fencing all around electric 17 fencing is acres pretty okay. inexpensive you can get one solar powered electric fence box that will that will power eight miles of electric fence. I've been looking into we'll it because we'll I just bought a larger property. The so that thing is they're, they're coming close to the home. My new neighbors have two children. One is one year old and one is two years old. They can't really, you know, it's very difficult because they don't come out at dusk, dusk and dawn like everybody says. They come out anytime they want and they right. run around in their yard and so, you know, it's the same thing. We have to be held prisoner in our yard with our little dogs. The other night, I was sitting outside with my dogs. You know, they, I'm, I don't take them on a leash. I have enough yard. Right. Okay, and I heard the howling. Sometimes I hear gunshots from the other side of my house, just some kind of pistol. This night, I heard a shotgun go off. And I grabbed my dogs and went inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've tried trapping them. They just laugh at me. I, you know, I've hear people trying to shoot. Well, bullets fly. They do fly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, I've done Have you about, hired a I, professional I've trapper? I've even urine, okay? Right. So let's just do, <laughs> I've done everything. Now, the, I just, I appreciate your information, but I have also studied that the great pyrenees dogs which are wonderful dogs but they're also nocturnal they wake up and they bark all night long at anything a lot of us have cats that are barn cats mm -hmm. you know they don't they don't come in and out right you know every day the man mentioned um the facebook posting which i just uh, every day i look at that and somebody has been devastated chickens uh cats again uh, i had a, le a lamb that i had just been born i understand gutted, i do yep and it's horrible took the other one away and all they left just to really gross you out left their two little feet there yeah you know, you know how I hard that is i do i used to take okay. care of lambs i used to live on a farm well this we one had maggots. Shepherd, they had so. opened it up it had maggots all over it it was the most disgusting thing most devastating thing i've ever seen since i've lived out here I understand. I that. did not know there were coyotes, or obviously I wouldn't have well, been that's putting my animals new. out there like that. Now I have to go every night, put the animals in the barn where they're used to being outside grazing all night, shut the doors, and up until last week, it was really hot in my barn. Okay, but I had to do it to protect them from getting killed. Uh, across the street, well, I don't know if it's across the street. I'm I'm looking at a. a, a a, a house that was is or was under construction on Sterling Road. The address is 13851 Sterling Road. I look at, from my home, I look at their backyard, which is five acres. The hill property is 10 acres. Uh, my neighbor and I look at um, a big grassy area that since they have stopped doing construction on this house, there are a pack of coyotes living in there. The grass there is over five feet mm -hmm. tall. It's perfect. So habitat. I am here to request to our community that someone go over there and instead of putting a lien on their swale, cut the grass and charge them for it. That's going to take. Hey Terry, it's Terry, take if I, I yeah. apologize for interrupting. That's all we right. will have public comment where you can talk about that code issue, and I would really like for you to do that. Oh, um, I'd did like I get to off keep track? These questions, yeah. For, I'm sorry. For, for questions that would be pertinent to everybody that's listening. Yeah, I'm just trying to get everything in and shut up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like some of your some of your suggestions don't apply to this area because it's it would be it's been expensive. So I know, far. but again, I'm putting the lights in and doing everything that we're being told to do. But lights uh, don't work. But well, fence. see what I mean? Very. I've heard of people getting air horns, and now if you don't mind. That's a good form of hazing. Okay, well, if you have somebody next door to you riding their horse, and you blow off an air horn, and somebody right. gets hurt, so, yeah. it's not, it's a good solution for the moment, but somebody might get hurt. Shooting bullets is 
no, that's not. Yeah, that's so not let's, appropriate. Let's, you know? can, can we can we close that out? Yeah. I, I just let's. I think we. I think what we need is a list of potential things that we can do. Option. You know. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's which, a lot. Of, we've thrown out a lot there. of things here. Yeah. Um, some of it's in the presentation. Some of it came up afterwards. But I think uh, whether you know it's somebody internally or whatever, we we need to kind of re-listen to this and and get a list of things that we want to. Um, that, that might be helpful in different situations for right. different people. Our main concern, I think I, I'm safe saying, is um, we're certainly concerned about all, all the animals, but what has really been an issue and has really been kind of a scourge here the last six months, and it has been fairly recent, is the loss of all the, the lambs, the right. chickens, the things like that. It's, it's getting wiped out. No, I and believe so, it. So I we, it. Need, we need because it's a some, fresh source that's never been protected, and the coyotes need, know what that. What we need is those recommendations that will right. help out those folks. Yep. So, so I think that's where we need to go. I saw a hand here. Yeah. Do we have a mic? Well, but it, it won't. It won't get on TV. Where, where did the mics go? Here. Um, first, we have to understand where they come, uh, the coyotes. So you have been saying that it's a problem from six m months ago. And all that starts when the pet stores, exotic pet stores, start to selling exotic animals. It's not only with coyotes, but it's only with fox, with dragon bears, with cobras, whatever, all exotic animals. I don't know why this is not regulated by the government. Yeah. I don't know why when they got enough of this animal because it's destroying the house, simply put it outside, simply put it on a large field and then buy. And that's why we have those problems right now. So I don't know if government, uh, local government or state or Broward or county I don't know who can address that and regulate that. Right, right, thank you. That will be one right. little solution. Yeah, yeah, thank you, appreciate it, it's a good thought. All right, any other comments? Okay, thank you, Kristen. I don't know if you have, you have I just wanted to say yeah. that, you know, since the coyote issue is so new here, people are not used to it, and right. that takes training and community-wide education to let people know what they need to do to keep coyotes off of their properties and how to haze coyotes. That Those two things are really important because they are becoming habituated. They know that there's all this great prey running around completely unprotected from them, from right. their perspective, right? So using some of these, offering this up, teaching people how to haze, teaching people to keep their food inside, not feed the wildlife, that kind of thing, that's going to help a lot. And m possibly even eradicating um, the feral cat colonies right. because they're, they're a draw. They're a huge draw. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you. This obviously, you can tell, is a topic that's really important oh, to yeah. our town. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get so, it. I've, so like I said, you. I've lived yeah. with all this. I had farms. I've had animals my whole life, so I totally right. understand. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, Mayor. Uh, yes. just, uh, Kristen, thank you for being here. Obviously, we, we have a role that we can play in continuing to educate people. So from a staff standpoint, we'll, we'll make a concerted effort to get this information out to the public via every channel we have. Uh, because w we all need to be more knowledgeable on this. And I yeah, we really do. I think there, you know, up until this, this evening, I think it's been more of kind of trial and error. I think now we've heard some things that are not simple to do, mm -hmm. but there are things that people can do to protect their, uh, you know, their livestock or animals. So, um, so I'd like to get that out as soon as we can. Those. Yeah, I think those education will be key, and yes. uh, and we'll continue to work on that as well. Awesome, great, thank you. Okay. All right, great. Um, all right, so um, the next item on our agenda is public comment. We have uh, public comment tonight. We have one speaker, Mayor, and that's uh, Catalina Stube. Did I pronounce that properly? I'm sorry if I didn't. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. 
Cindy, turn that mic around. Turn it on. Yep. Good. It's good. Did. It's my first time, so thank welcome. you, Mayor. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for everything you are doing and protect our rural mm -hmm. um, lifestyle. I know you, uh, David. Um, with some of you, I talk um, about my issue. It's not that I have an issue, but uh, my concerns. So my mainly concerns is about parks. I have four children, and the most important thing to me is family and uh, the base of society. The way I'm, I'm trying to um, get that part strong is to support family and, and get away the technology from my kids, which means uh, playing outside, which means um, uh, enjoy the parks, the, the beautiful parks we have. So recently, I um, I tried to to get a little birthday party get, get it in uh, in Rolling Oaks Park, and by they told me I have to pay almost three hundred dollars to have something outside. If I gather more than te ten people, so which is like my family, we are only nine <laughs> members of the family, and. Uh, so I'm coming here to discuss what are the fee, uh, what are the regulations, what are the ways that we can support actually uh, teenagers enjoy our community parks. And um, I understand we should um, have um, a deposit when you use the park, uh, but then pick it up just after and then you return the deposit. But uh, I don't find fair to use outside the, the parks and pay and, and pay a deposit, both. Um, I think um, toilets on the parks, I think I are all almost open to the public, but that one especially is not open to the public. Unless it's a request, but unless okay. if it's a request, they have to pay, blah, blah, and then uh, they have this beautiful Pavilion, uh, this beautiful soul, whatever house, and um, I understand that you have to pay for that. However, I think prices are expensive, and that's why not many people go there. And we should promote these beautiful parks and uh, get our kids together and uh, like this promote more outside. Uh, I don't know, activities instead of technology. Right. That's my little point. Great, good, yeah. Thank you for coming by. Of course. I think, you know, one of, it just it, so happens. I actually thank you for helping me the last time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, let's we'll have one other speaker, but I have some comments after all the speakers are done. So please hang out. Yeah. She's the speaker. I see. No, I think we have one more. Uh, I think Terry's going to come up. I think she's just filling out the form. That's all right. Come on up, Terry. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, for the please. presentation. Uh, when we first found out that we were having coyote issues, uh, we did go on Google and do our research, and we um, have done everything, including the urine, um, that has been recommended. Some things are just too expensive, like refencing your yard, if, if especially a lot of people here have pretty big yards. Okay, um, we haven't been able to trap anything except a raccoon, which I let go. Um, uh, it's just been very distressing. Um, we have done everything that she has suggested. That she has suggested. Um, I do not suggest anyone, especially if you're a um, not a good um, shot, that you go out and try yeah, to no, shoot a, a shotgun at it in the dark in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't make any sense. You could hit anybody. Right. Air horns, yeah, that's great as long as your your people don't mind you shooting one off at three in the morning when you're trying to sleep. Yeah, that's a problem too. The the 
the um, the sound of these animals is chilling. They wake you up at 3.30 in the morning. They howl. Then all the other dogs that you know, dogs that are living outside, start barking. Um, these are outside dogs. They're not inside the house, you know. So people who have to want to bring their dogs inside and they're not used to it, I don't know. That's not my problem. I have little dogs and they're inside. But um, basically, I, um, I, I just feel they're, they're, they're too close. You know, um, there are some pro there's a property that I had mentioned before that is that my front door faces their backyard. It's a 10 acre plot where they started to build a house and didn't finish. Now, my neighbor and I look at this grassy area every single day. The grass is definitely taller than me and there are definitely coyotes that live there. I don't know who's responsible. I don't know why they didn't finish the house. Maybe they ran out of money. It's a huge house with 10 acres. Nobody's maintaining the property. And I have seen snakes that I haven't seen in 15 years. You know, um, and obviously the coyotes that we didn't know we had, they're living there. They come out every day and you know, just run up and down the road. Nobody feeds them. Do you, do you by any chance know the address of that property? I want to make sure that... Um, yes, I do. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to know kind of what's going on with that property. My understanding is there is some sort of a code issue already being implemented there. I did talk to coding a couple of weeks ago. I said, what's going on over there? Because they were going really fast to build this huge house. And then they quit. And I said, well, what's going on? Finally, I called because it was grass was just getting higher and higher and higher with the rain. As they said, there was a lien against the property because the swale wasn't cut. And I said, okay, well, that's kind of a stupid thing not to do is cut your swale. It makes everybody's property look bad. Uh, then I learned some more things. I can't remember where I got the information. Um, was that the people ran out of money which could or may yeah, or may not I mean, be true. But, but, we, but we can check on that property. We, we it's 13851 Sterling Road. Okay. So, and I'm speaking not for a community. I'm I speaking understand. for me and my next door neighbor that have only lived there a year. They have small children and, and the coyotes come and run in their yard and they're very scared. Right. Um, I, my kids are grown, thank God. I don't have to put up with that, but. Okay. Um, We've done all we can do. We did our research before tonight. Right. And nothing is working. But I am asking, I am requesting this community to please find someone to cut down the grass in the back of that house. That's going to scare away a lot of animals and any other properties that you see that are overgrown. They should be taken care of by somebody. Obviously, the owner's not going to take care of it. Yep, we'll check into it. All right. Okay, awesome. That's it. All Thank right. You. Here's Thank your you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate Ken? it. Yeah, oh, yeah, if you can. Just. All right. Is there any other public comment tonight? That's it? Okay. Catalina, thank you for coming out as well. Um, actually, your timing is perfect. Um, that's why I wanted to make sure you hung out for a minute because the Parks Board, matter of fact, just last night they met and um, this is the exact topic that they're talking about is the rules of the park, the fees of the park, um, and I would love for you to attend the next Parks meeting if you can, if your schedule allows so that they get, you know, the resident input on what's working, what's not working, and this is the perfect time to do it because they were already, the topic was already being brought up and um, pretty much all the councils there so we get to hear your thoughts as well and um, would really uh, th I think that'd be a, a great forum if, if you're able to fit it in your schedule all right mr. mr. mayor if can I interrupt yeah, yeah, just a comment. Um, I know that my appointee to the parks board um, had withdrawn and uh, Ms. Doobie had contacted me for uh, an appointment, so I am um, seriously considering making her my appointment to the Parks Board if she okay. is so inclined to take that. That would that. be awesome. 
So yeah, that's well, it. I'll speak to her, but yeah, that I, I think I think we sounds like a great idea. All right, great, thank you. Uh, you know, we really appreciate the public comment here. I mean, we can't always solve every problem. Matter of fact, rarely can we solve your problem right here tonight. But to hear the thoughts, to hear the concerns is critical so that we can take it back, we can get with administration, we can get with the right folks and see what we can do. So thank you for coming out. All right. Um, Okay, um, so that concludes uh, public comments. Probably we'll have some comments when we get to council member comments in a few minutes. So if you want to hang out for that, that might be good. But the next item on the agenda is the board reports. Do we have any uh, board reports this evening? All right, seeing none, council member comments. Bob, why don't you go ahead and go? I'd love to jump in. So about three years ago, we started having coyote problems. I live on the west side of town. I live out on 198 Terrace. And right over the fence is Pembroke Pines. And one of my neighbors came to me and said, my wife's cat, his wife used to feed cats. My wife's cats are disappearing. And I was finding hindquarters. I was finding cat parts in my yard. Then squirrel parts and all that sort of thing. So, you know, first it was the little animals going away. Then one of my neighbors had their goats hit, and I've heard goats, sheep, and as you said, cows, all sorts of things. It's horrible. So we farm chickens. We have uh, poultry for, for eggs. We raise chickens for eggs. We don't eat them. And when you raise something from being this big, day-old chick, up until uh, two, three years old, and a coyote comes in and takes out 16 of them in about a half hour, you get pretty upset. You know, they're not pets, but uh, you get attached to something you feed for three years straight and take care of it since it was day out of an egg. Um, we invested in everything we thought would be appropriate. I have electric fence, not, not the kind she was talking about, but I got the mesh that goes around it that uh, you touch it and you get zapped. It keeps the dogs out. It keeps the, uh, uh, the cats don't bother the chickens, but the raccoons and possums do. So I thought I had it all licked. I even have an electric door that opens uh, however long I program it before and after sunset. So we're sitting in eating our breakfast really early in the morning about two months ago. Uh, the sun was coming up at the time at around six or so. And all of a sudden uh, I let the dog out and the dog's barking like crazy. So I call her in and she won't come in. I finally go out and drag her in and Five minutes later, we hear the chickens going nuts on our surveillance equipment. They don't make noise when the sun comes up. They're pretty quiet. They, the rooster is one thing, but the rest of them are quiet. Well, my wife said something's going on. I go out there, and I see dead chickens everywhere. And, you know, my first thing is go after the ones that are still flapping, at least, to try to save them. And I saw the coyote go right over my fence. And the dog got out. And she was sniffing around, and she started going nuts again. The coyote never left. You know, I don't think it's habitualized to people, um, because this, this one's not around very often. That day, I took two of the chickens and, uh, that were dead, and I put them out as bait. I sat out all afternoon. I sat out. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, because I know they're either AM or PM sunrise sunset I sat out there for two three hours waiting I'm not gonna say how and uh, you know they never showed up that week I got game cameras and I repointed some of our surveillance cameras I saw them for one day after what I haven't seen them since and that's like I said close to two months ago now now you know it was my mistake that coop door that's electric that opens and closes automatically I didn't realize it was opening way too early in the morning. It was opening probably 15 minutes before, 20 minutes before sunrise. And those chickens being out early, it's my mistake. It's my fault. You know, they're, they're wild animals. If it, it could have been a bobcat. We have bobcats out west also. Could have been a lot of things. Could have been one of the neighborhood dogs. We got a dog that kills neighborhood chickens. So, you know, it was, I wrote articles for the town newsletter and for DRW magazine about coyotes and how same things as, uh, as um, our speaker said, 
you kill them off, they come back. They, they kill hundreds of thousands a year in the West, and they haven't gotten rid of them yet. Now, you know, I, I, I did go through the paperwork that she also provided us, and there's some good ideas in there that I won't get into. Hopefully, the t I'll, I'll post them on Facebook. There are different uh, uh, PDFs on building the right types of enclosures. I mean, my chickens should be safe. This was my mistake, and I had snares up. The only way to catch a coyote, forget about traps, snares are the only way that works. But then you got to have the heart. You got to be able to be uh, to to dispatch them once you catch them because you can't let them loose. So I just wanted to mention this because I was the guy saying, "Oh, you, nature abhors a vacuum. You shoot two coyotes, you'll get three back," until they were mine. Then I was out there that day with a gun, that night with a gun, and the next morning with a gun. It was a waste of time. I mean, these things, they cover, I think she said 36 square miles for the males and less for the females. I must have had the 36 mile guy because he hasn't been back since the day after. I haven't seen anything to do with him. So it's painful, it, it, it hurt. And you know, they're, <laughs> you can't just go and get new chickens today to replace the 16 layers that you just lost yesterday. So it's painful and, and it, it still bothers us when we talk about it at home. But uh, our thing now is protection. I mean, if something does come, my surveillance cameras are gonna let me know this time uh, instead of me just figuring it out. But we've taken the steps appropriately to, to keep them out of the yard. Now, we don't have any larger animals anymore, but uh, she, uh, uh, um, what was her name, the speaker? Kristen. Kristen. Kristen provided us with some documentation on enclosures that you can build for goats and sheep, you know, uh, uh, if you've got uh, calves, things like that. But uh, I, I'm not sure what else to do. I'm in the Everglades almost. I'll be in the Everglades on Saturday up in the up by the cane fields. I see them all the time now running on the levees. We can shoot them all here in town, like she said, and they'll be back because I live out west. When I go out to Holiday Park, not very frequently, but once every couple of months, I'll see a coyote running on the levee. You never see them in the water. They're, they're coming down from the north. They're around, and I don't think they're going anywhere. I asked for this to be put together tonight in December. Thank you for bringing her. I think she was very helpful. But uh, it's, it's just something that we have to protect our animals against. It's, it's that simple. And our family. I mean, I'm not sure uh, what the other solutions are and what I'd, I'd heard tonight. But it's uh, my, my friend Karen bought a great Pyrenees. She hasn't mentioned the barking that you were concerned about. But she had donkeys. She had two donkeys for a number of years. They still came and, came and killed her goats. Uh, then they started, they killed an emu. And emus are supposed to be one of the most dangerous animals there are. They killed an emu on her. She went and got one of these great Pyrenees. And she's had it for almost two years now. The hawks don't even come by after her chickens and her, her uh, geese and ducks. She doesn't have any problems with it anymore. And that'll be our next thing if we get hit again. I'll, I'll pick up some sort. It's not just Great Pyrenees, Borzois, Akitas, a lot of those big husky dogs that look like wolves. I guess it's just something wired into the coyotes. So I did want to make a couple of comments about this because this is near and dear to my heart too. And I don't want to see anybody's animals. George Morris, a lot of you know George Morris, he was in tears. He lost 15 newborn lambs that were born in the past week, all, at the, all within a couple of days. They were coming every night and praying on his poor animals. So yeah, it's, it's a painful thing. So I have something else I need to talk about tonight for a few minutes as well. So we have a historical building over in Southwest Meadows Sanctuary. And about a year ago, or it's probably not even that long ago, six, nine months ago, we went over there to drop off some materials that we'd collected from s and um, you know, we, uh, we, I noticed at that time that there were some bees in the building back there. Uh, the building was fairly clear of any shrubs and any bushes. Well, a couple of months ago, I got a drone, and I've been vo videoing each one of our parks for December so that you can use that as reference material. So I went out to, um, to uh, Southwest Meadows Sanctuary to fly the park and to video it. And uh, <laughs> I happened to park my, my truck right next to the historical building. And within two or three minutes, I was being attacked by bees. Not one or two, dozens and dozens of bees. They were in my clothes, they were in my hair. I got nailed in the, in the neck, I got nailed in the leg. So it kind of, they got my attention. 
so I went back and I shot a video of the building and Russell's got it queued up. Um, I'd, I'd like you guys to take a look at this because I'm not, I, there's nothing forcing this decision, but it, it's, it's obvious that we've got a problem out there. So if you watch the monitors, I shot this uh, two weeks ago. This is my brilliant intro. So this is the side of the building, the north side of the building. And you'll notice that one of the boards are down. Every place there was an opening that I saw on the sides, bees were coming and going. You'll notice there's a paddle down and there's a busted window there. Bees were flying in and out of there like, like it was I-95. It was pretty amazing. There's also uh, where the building is coming apart. You'll see the siding there in the front corner. The block must have been knocked or something, but there were bees flying in and out there. There's our famous um, uh, saddle storage. If you look at the fascia on the building, it's missing in a couple of places. This is the nice side of the building. Uh, December, was this painted in the last couple of years? Yeah. This side looks really good. My goal was actually to come in and take down those trees that are on the right there so we can get this thing get a decent inspection of it and see what's going on, but that was my mistake. I parked, oh, to the right there, right about where this is, and I, the bees are right inside there. There are bees swarming. There are holes in the building that the bees are coming and going from throughout that side. I was just gonna go out there with the pole saw and cut that stuff down. I, I talked to December about it, and I sent her a text later. Nope, got stung by two bees, abandoned the project. So here, here's the problem. Look at the roof. All those gray spots are actually shingles that are, or tabs on shingles that are missing. You'll see, uh, I'll come back a couple of times. But uh, the roof itself is in pretty bad shape. There's two vents up there that don't have any kind of caulking or flashing around them. You'll notice the mineral paper down on the bottom there is peeled off. That might have happened during a storm. I don't know how long ago that happened. But also the right strap up at the top there, you'll see a black mark. That's a hole in the roof. Bees were coming and going from there, and it, it's not so much the bees as the rain and, and everything else that's coming and going. Who knows if they're, you know, what's in there. Um, you know, the whole point behind this was to get, nobody's going to get up on the roof and look at it. I wouldn't suggest that. So I, I, I flew the drone and got some video on it and tried to do a bit of an assessment on, on what's going on up there. The building itself looks like it's pretty deteriorated. What I wanted to suggest tonight was that nobody can go in this thing until we get some beekeepers in there. I spoke with uh, Detective Hobalis, who is a beekeeper. I don't know if you guys know that. He's got a hidden talent. And, uh, you know, the thinking is there's probably a million plus bees in there. And I don't know if you guys know, but bees are getting close to being an endangered species these days. They're dying off in massive numbers. So maybe we ask Jeff to come up with a plan to try to lure the bees out because there are ways to do that or to go in and take them out because he's got a beekeeping suit, he's official. So, you know, we probably ought to do that and then get the building inspected and make a decision on whether, all right, we put it off for until we get the funds or as we've spoken about before, perhaps what we do is uh, see if there's somebody out there who wants to take it off of our hands mm -hmm. or, or come up with various options. I wanted to put it out there because I've been looking at this building for years and I've never really inspected it before and it's in pretty bad shape. Right. So, something to put out there. Yeah, good, good, great. The only other item that I wanted to cover and I'm not sure if anybody else is so I'll be very brief. Folks, we have a charter review committee that started. Thanks for coming out, Jeff. Um, we have a charter review committee that started, the first meeting was uh, last month or beginning of this month, earlier this month. And I'll tell you something, folks. These are folks that are gonna be able to make a difference in changes. We're not looking for all kinds of crazy radical changes, but they're really taking the job seriously. The first meeting, I was very impressed by the people showing up. They, they've read it, they've compared our charter against some of the other cities. And I probably should throw something out there for those who don't know much about the charter. We are supposed to look at it every couple of years just to see if there's any changes. It doesn't compel us to make changes but it's been 10. So it's, it's a good time to take a look and see if there's anything that needs to be changed. But 
very impressed by the group. It's, it's a new group we put together. It's just a temporary board. They'll only be together for about six months, but they're working very effectively to come up with things to most importantly protect our rural lifestyle, to keep what we've got what it is and, and try to curb some of the development. So that's top of mind for everybody. I think that's all. Good. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point with that uh, historical building. It's time to make a plan and decide what's what's best. So okay. thanks for bringing that up. All right, who's next? I'll go. All right, great, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank everybody for coming. Um, as usual, uh, we've got a lot we've got a lot going on right now. Uh, I can report on some of it. <laughs> some of it I can't, and I'll get to that. Um, just uh, FYI for everybody. Um, we have the uh, Country Estates uh, Park Entrance Contest uh, coming in. We want uh, everybody to, you know, or anybody who has an interest to uh, submit sketches of what they want the front entrance off of 190 to look, uh, to look like. A crude sketch is all that's necessary uh, and you know, detailed what it is and, and uh, turn that in uh, at, the, at the front desk by the 15th of November. Um, we have the uh, Rural Arts Committee, the Holiday Lights uh, Decorations uh, Contest going on. Um, all the submittals need to be by the uh, 3rd of uh, December. And uh, we have the Broward County Property Appraiser here at Town Hall on the 18th uh, of October, uh, which is, I guess, the end of this week? No, next week, and uh, Monday uh, from 10 to 12. Uh, we have a car show. Uh, the, par the Parks Board's putting on their, their car show. Last year we didn't do it because of COVID. And it's a chili fest, and it's from uh, on the 4th of December from 10 to 4 at the Rolling Oaks Barn. Um, and, and I urge everybody to go to that. It's a lot of fun. You see some really nice cars, uh, hundreds of cars. People come in and, and compete for the bragging rights uh, that you get with that. And then... Um, we have uh, you, just uh, an FYI for everybody. We, we have uh, partnered uh, with a, a local business uh, firm called Urgent Med. They have a uh, kiosk, uh, small container on the side of the building right over here on the corner. And they administer uh, the COVID-19 shots, all three different uh, ones that have been approved by the uh, FDA or whatever the governing body is. They have the, the Pfizer, the Moderna, Moderna and the uh, uh, Johnson vaccine. It's uh, you stay in your car, you pull in, they see you, they come out, you fill out a questionnaire, uh, you know, standard medical questionnaire, the paperwork is very simple. They also do booster shots for the uh, Pfizer. Uh, if you qualify, make sure you have your CDC card uh, because they run the check on that. And they also are giving flu shots and uh, they, the, the really good news is they're also doing the PC, PCR, did I get that right? Yeah, PCR tests. Yep. Um, and their turnaround time is within 24 hours, That's great. which is excellent if you're traveling or flying or you know something to that effect. So um, I urge everybody to do that. I know I've sent probably a dozen people by now you know, over there. Uh, hopefully they all went. <laughs> they said they did. I don't know if they did. <laughs> but you know, you know how that goes. So, um, but, it, but it's... Uh, uh, run by a local, locally owned, uh, 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 the business is owned by a, a, a person that lives in Southwest Ranches, and they've partnered up and want to thank Andy and, and Russell and everybody, Russell, thank you uh, for putting that together. I, I was like maybe their second booster shot. I just happened to be here at the right time, you know, and, and, got, and got it. And uh, it's really convenient. And they're open Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5. Or nine to six. Nine to six, nine to six. Sorry. So you can catch it on the way home. It's not a, if you're not you know you're not feeling good. You want to get a COVID test. Just pull right in. They'll come right out. They'll do it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's we're trying to make it. You know, it's it's a benefit to our residents to have a place to go to. And so I can't uh, say thank you enough to Russell you know, for working on it and putting it all together. And Andy, of course. Um, as you all may know, I'm not going to try to steal the show from from legal, but uh, we have our uh, trial going on right now with uh, Pembroke Pines. I don't want to get into uh, any of the details with it since the trial's in progress. We're in day three, and uh, it's uh, uh, myself and Councilmember Albritton 
have been there every day. And uh, I can tell you that it's uh, very interesting, uh, all the data that's going on for the last, uh, since, since the town's inception. And I know this is being recorded and, and uh, the whatnot, so I don't want to get any deeper into it than that. Right. So, Good. you know, and uh, we, we plan, uh, Council Member Albert and I plan on being there every day until the conclusion, Great. see what's going on. And I'll wrap it up with that, Mayor. Awesome. Great. Thank you. All right, I'll go. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. David Kaczynski, um, District Court Councilman. Um, let me um, begin by um, stating that, um, Ms. Stube, um, yeah, um, you had indicated to me earlier that you would um, like to sit on the Parks Board. Okay. Um, I do have that as an available appointee. I, my appointee um, stepped down, and I'm going to go ahead and appoint you on the Parks Board. Speak with December. Uh, and exchange information. There's a lot of learning that you're going to have to do uh, about this, and she's going to tell you about the technicalities. But uh, congratulations, you'll be uh, my appointee on the board. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, begin with, um, you know, as I, um, when I come into my home, I come off a of 75 southbound exit at uh, Sheridan, take the U turn, and the growth along the edge has been covering up that Southwest Ranch sign, that beautiful sign. And I don't know who did it. Somebody in the neighborhood came by and cleared it off. So now you go by there, you can see one little sliver of the bushes cut. You can see the sign. It's very beautiful. I'm going to thank whoever did that. Thank you. Uh, the trial. Um, I'm planning to go out tomorrow. Um, I, I understand it begins at 10 o'clock. I'm going to uh, sit around for a little bit and see what's going on? Yes. Nine o'clock is gonna to start tomorrow. Nine? Okay. Yeah. Um, I plan to um, come out tomorrow and uh, sit and watch what's going on. It's really important for our town. Can't really participate, but you can sit in the audience, watch, and see what, uh, what's going on there. Uh, let's see. Of the COVID vaccine uh, thing over here, I went um, last Saturday to um, have my booster in and out. It was it was great. There was no line, and it was very pleasant. The people were very nice, and I was done in and out really quick. I like to remind people: do not leave your key fobs in your car. Take them in at night. Lock your car. Make sure your property is secured. We've had um, too many break-ins. And a lot of it can be avoided if you just bring your key fobs in the car. Make sure your cars are locked. <clears throat> uh, earlier in the week, um, if you drive down Sterling Road now uh, from Flamingo through uh, Hancock or Flamingo through Volunteer, you will see um, the FPL has been out replacing a lot of the um, power poles. And I did get a phone call from a neighbor. Uh, he was complaining about um, the contractors leaving their vehicles out overnight and um, tearing up the swale and destroying the asphalt. And I just hope that um, we're going to be able to follow up with that issue uh, once they're completed with their job. Um, for Mr. and Mrs. Fernandez, thank you for coming out tonight. It's really important you're able to um, vent your concerns. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you um, take a drive from uh, Sterling going from Polity toward Hancock. You'll see a sign on the side of the road that says 13801. I think it's a Sandbrook. That's the road that I drove back with last weekend. And I'm telling you, a property with the grass is like this high yeah. on, that, on that neglected property. And I'm really hoping that something can be done because it, it looks like an easy place for these um, coyotes to hide and um, and breed and replicate. Um, I think it's it's a big concern for all of our neighbors. Uh, the next meeting, um, the Tisdor issues are going to be discussed, uh, where uh, several roads in Sunshine Ranches and the drainage project in Country Estates will be addressed. So that's going to be the next meeting in two weeks. Um, I'd like to remind you to bring your animals in at, in at night, and. I guess that just kind of wraps up my my comments. Excellent. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Can I jump in for a second? Sure. A Andy, uh, talking about that 
the home in Sunshine Ranch is on Sterling. Where we have the Can we send EDJ, EDJ in there and have him mow it? If there's, because if the owner's like absent or whatever, and then just uh, back charge the owner. I, I, I'm familiar with the property. In fact, I drove by it as recently as today. The yeah. property itself is, is almost 10 acres. Yes, it is overgrown. We do have the ability to do that. We traditionally have, have, have shied away from that only because once we start with that maintenance, we own it going forward. But in a case like this, where there's a potential threat to the community, uh, we certainly have the ability to address it and add it to uh, a lien that would be on the property. So yes. Yeah, I, I would think we'd want to probably, you know, with, with the council approval, we want to we want to jump on that yesterday. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah, Julio and I have already spoken about this, so that's okay. Kind of Thank where you, we Jerry. were headed, recognizing uh, the threat to the community. Yeah. Uh, it's not that's not going to stop potentially those coyotes there. It may displace them, uh, but we can certainly try to address it as best we can that way. Okay, thank you, Andy. And, and if I can, one line. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fernandez, once they clear some of that, it may trigger the coyotes coming toward your property. So I just please be aware that that, that is a, a possible consequence. So thank you. Not Mr. Mayor. Jim, it's all yours. <laughs> thank you. Council, staff, residents, thank you very much for coming out. I will be brief. I do want to piggyback on Councilman Jablonski and Councilman Hartman's statement. The trial is very interesting. <laughs> I will tell you that. It's very interesting. And Councilman Hartman, your video showed what looked like an outhouse on the side of the uh, historical building. That's not an outhouse. That's a historical, to me it's historical because it comes from the Circle S Ranch, uh, something that had been around since the town was formed. But it's a place to store saddles. And thanks to December, the Parks Board is looking at possibly bringing that uh, somewhere, restoring it, and finding a place maybe at Town Hall or someone to, uh, someplace to put that. And I think it's a very well-built, a, a very nice, different structure to, you know, to bring in. There's a couple small artifacts underneath the building that we got to get out so the bees don't get to us. And those are the posts that went around the track that told the riders at what point on the track that they were at, the quarter mile, eighth mile, uh, mile post. And we would like to find a place for those possibly here at Town Hall also. And then I'd like to say real quickly that I am honest and truly pleased to announce that the Public Safety and Traffic Committee will start in January. You know I campaigned about traffic and with the help of our administrator, uh, we are gonna start that committee. There'll be six members from the town chosen one chosen by each of the council members and one at large they'll go for six months they'll deal with the traffic they'll deal with uh, signage signs going up more more speed limit signs uh, they'll deal with public relations getting the word out as Jeff mentioned many a time keep the key fob out of the car don't leave it in the car so things like that that they can bring to the public and I do want to say thank you to our law enforcement officers here in Davie I believe it was Saturday, maybe Sunday night, I'm not sure which, 8.30 in the evening, the front of my house lit up like a Christmas tree with red and blue lights, and they were out there writing traffic citations. And as I stepped to the window, I happened to notice that the van was there, and the lady that passed me every morning and every evening and two or three times a day, running probably 50 mile an hour, and I would motion to her to slow down, it's 25, and she'd give me the one finger salute back, well, I'm proud to say that I think our officers gave her a nice citation for that. So thank you, officers. And with that, thank you. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. And thanks for your work on that uh, safety board. I'm looking forward to that getting in place. And I think that's going to be great for our town. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Yep. Well, I'd like to say I have a few comments, but I believe you all did an amazing job at covering everything. And rather than repeating, I'm just going to move on. But uh, thank you for all that. So um, legal comments, please. Thanks, Mayor. There's not going to be any legal comments tonight. OK. All right. Thank you. Administrative comments. Richard's always more brief than Keith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a few things, Mayor. Uh, as you all know, we've been working on our, our license plate readers, the camera program. Russell's put a lot of time into this. Uh, we've had some good progress with that. We look forward to bringing that to you all on the next council meeting. So we're going to be able to get that program moving. So thank Russell for that. Uh, tonight's meeting is for the first time we're actually broadcasting live on our YouTube channel. 
I did get a text from a resident who has informed me that the volume is a little bit low, so we do have some troubleshooting to do, uh, but we are simulcasting the meeting, so uh, hopefully we'll get some good feedback on that. We'll be able to, to, to work through any issues that we have. Uh, as you all know, we surveyed the community earlier this year. We've gotten the results back. I'm working on a PowerPoint for you all, and so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you in two weeks at the next council meeting. So I'm going to give you a summary of the results that came back from that uh, from that survey. So I wanted to tease that a little bit. Uh, you were all talking, some of you were talking before about people leaving their fobs in the car. Good news and bad news. Our part one crimes, our, our serious crimes, we, we have a 25% reduction year over year. So we're really in good shape. I can tell you that in Davie, they're rolling down 14%. So we got the cream of the crop as far as the officers over here. Sorry, Larry. Uh, but our guys here were doing a real good job. Those crimes are down 25%. The worst part, the biggest problem we've had is, is a, we've had a run of stolen cars where people feel very safe here. They get home, they park the car, they leave it in the driveway, and they leave the keys in it. Bad guy gets in the car, he puts the foot on the brake, he pushes the button, he doesn't need to find your keys. Car starts, he knows the keys are in it. He's off and, and your car is gone. So we've had a problem with that. We've had some good success in recovering those, but I'd rather not have them stolen. So uh, you know, for anybody who's listening, please don't, don't leave your fobs in the car. Lock your car, don't leave anything visible. Uh, the only other thing I had, Mayor, was we had some good, good success with FEMA with a program last year. And while we were meeting virtually, uh, it was kind of a quiet rollout, but it's something that's really good for our residents. And I'd like to ask the Public Works Director, Rod Lay, to come up just to, to share with the public through, through this venue uh, some, some exciting developments, All right. some, some staff hard work that's paid off well. So Very good. Uh, Rod, if you would. And that's all I have after, after Rod's done. Awesome. There. Great. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Good evening, Mayor, Council. So yeah, we, we had, a, um, I think going back to, if you'll indulge me, going back to about 20, uh, 2014, before I got here, the town was trying to get into the CRS program, which is a program where uh, the, you're allowed to get a, a certain percentage of, of fee off of your flood insurance. Right. My understanding is we got into that program where we initiated the, the attempt to get into it because we were initially part of the county's program. And then when the counties and the auditors found out that we were essentially piggybacking on their program, uh, we had to make that jump into, and get into the CRS ourselves. So um, just to give you guys an idea at what goes into it, there's multiple activities uh, that go into preparing the documentation for it. There's uh, 100 series activities. There's um, 200. 300, 400, there's like about seven or eight different series of activities. In those things, there's probably another uh, five to eight additional per thing. And then each documented series requires dozens of, of pages of information. So ultimately, the, the report that we prepared for FEMA um, and the submittal that we made probably uh, a incorporated hundreds of pages of information. And that was made possible uh, by, by the team that we had in place. So um, if you guys can imagine, a document that probably took between three of us hours and hours to prepare. Um, I just really want to thank our staff uh, for the effort that they put into it. Uh, Philip specifically, Emily specifically, um, for pouring hours and hours and days into this effort. So ultimately, um, we ended up with a rating of seven. And it's my understanding that there's only two other municipalities at the time, mm -hmm. two other municipalities in Broward that had a higher rating than us uh, of wow. a six. So wow. we got a very favorable rating. Uh, it was a big accomplishment on our part, I think. And also ultimately got this, which is a plaque commemorating that awesome. with the seven. Awesome. So. Just wanted to share that with you guys. Big accomplishment for us. So. Great, great. Thank you, Rod. Thank you for sharing that with us. The, yeah, yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. So, so every every class, every rating that you get, um, it starts at a nine. So if uh, a ten, you're really not part of it, or you're you're in some sort of um, probationary period if, if you have an issue. But so as if you get into a, a class of a nine, you get a five percent rate. So every class you go up, you get an additional five percent discount on your flood insurance. So we. We've uh, had the ability to get 15% off for our residents on their flood insurance. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. 
Yeah, you know, we, we, have, we have a small staff but they do an amazing job and they are true professionals and um, do the job and do the job right the way it's supposed to be done. And um, it's been shown over and over and over again. And this is something that, uh, you know, could easily, you know, slide under the radar and nobody really realize it. But every literally, you know, we're all going to see um, better insurance rates on our flood insurance because of the work that they did. Um, behind the scenes. So thank you all for that. Really appreciate it. All right. Item number 10. An ordinance. Second yes. reading. Yes, Mayor. This is an ordinance of the town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, vacating, closing, and abandoning a portion of unimproved 49th Street right-of-way recorded in original record book uh, page, I'm sorry, original record book 38262, uh, page 1888 of the public records of Broward County, Florida, being a portion of parcel B Alderman parcels, according to the plat thereof, recorded in plat book 172, page 12 of the public records of Broward County, Florida. Generally described as a portion of Southwest 49th Street extending 330 feet on either side of Southwest 192nd Terrace, authorizing the preparation and execution of effectuating documents, providing instructions to the town clerk, providing for recordation, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Great, thank you. Do I have a motion on the side? Motion to approve. Thank second. you. Second, thank you. All right, is there any, uh, any discussion on this item? Not for me. No. All right, seeing none, is there any public discussion on this item? Seeing none, public uh, and closed. Russell, if you please call the roll. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Jablonski? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passes. Very good. Item number 11, please. This is an ordinance of the Town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, vacating, closing, and abandoning a portion of unimproved road easement recorded in original records book 19831, page 75 of the public records of Broward County, Florida, being a portion of tract 64 in section 34, township 50 south, Range 39 East, Everglades Land Company Subdivision, according to the plat thereof, recorded in Plat Book 2, page 1 of the public records of Miami-Dade County, said lands lying and being in the town of Southwest Ranches, Broward County, Florida, generally described as a portion of Southwest 54th Place between Southwest, um, between Southwest 207th Terrace and Southwest 208th Lane, and a portion of Southwest 207th Terrace extending approximately 650 feet north of Southwest 54th Place, authorizing the preparation and execution of effectuating documents, providing instructions to the town clerk, providing for recordation, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Is there any council comment on this item? No. Seeing none, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, public comment is closed. If we can please call the roll. Councilmember Albritton? Yes. Councilmember Jablonski? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passes. Item number 12, please. Item number 12 is a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Southwest Ranches, Florida, approving an agreement with Her Homes LLC in the amount of $66,184 for the Southwest 202nd Avenue and Southwest 50th Street drainage improvement project authorizing the mayor, town administrator, and town attorney to enter into an agreement, approving a budget amendment, and, pro and providing for an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, can you please call the roll. Councilmember Albritton? Yes. Councilmember Jablonski? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. Motion passes. And then we have four sets of minutes. I think we'll do those all in one motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any uh, corrections, adjustments to these sets of minutes? Any one of the four? I see any. Is there any public comment on these minutes? Seeing none, we can please call the roll. Councilmember Albritton? Yes. Councilmember Jablonski? Yes. Councilmember Kaczynski? Yes. Vice Mayor Hartman? Yes. Mayor Bright Cruz? Yes. 
Motion to adjourn, Mayor. Awesome. Thank you.